good morning, everyone. Welcome to my talk. I'm going to speak about how to build a multilingual search system and how to improve that, uh, um, of maybe to be precise, how we build it and how we improved it. Uh, just a brief intro about myself. I'm a senior software engineer at Mimecast uh, Services Limited, uh, based in London. I'm an Apache Lucene and Elasticsearch enthusiast. Um, I did my master's here in Germany from University of Freiburg. Um, that's my LinkedIn account if you want to connect to me. Um, and let's take a let's take a, a glance at Mimecast. Let me introduce my company, Mimecast. Mimecast. Uh, makes uh, billions of uh, users of their 32,200 plus customers, um, their emails and business data safer. Um, they, we store around 287 billion plus emails under our management in the size of uh, more than 40 petabytes. We process around 456 million plus emails every day and our search volume is around 3 million messages or emails every week. Um, we have 12 data centers uh, strategically placed around, our, around the globe, and uh, that, that's what we call basically grids to, to serve our customers in different geographical regions uh, better. And the story I'm going to tell you about today uh, begins when uh, Mimecast opened their data center uh, or started their German grid uh, in early 2018. So <clears throat> although it's multilingual, mostly we are going to focus on uh, German and English because that's how we started uh, serving customers non-English first time. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's, the, that's the famous joke about <clears throat> German Scrabble. The fact that German companies were the first companies uh, or customers that we served whose data was non-English. And um, our simplistic approach uh, at the beginning was that we will use just white space analyzer, so you know, we, can, we can break it on white space and then so whichever language it could be, because would, most of the languages are broken down into white space. But German, in their unique uh, or can say unmatched uh, ability to create longest words by conjugating words after another, uh, it's really hard uh, you know, to uh, break that word into subwords if you, if you really tokenize only on white space. So imagine a pain of a person, for example, searching for that word if you are, st if you are storing only on white space and searching on white space tokenizer. So um, for example, <clears throat> people might want to, to, to search that word just by searching for gazettes, isn't it? I mean, why can't they search by just gazettes and find the email containing that? So we need to change something there. Um, and then um, maybe it's not that every email contains that many long words, but uh, some of the real, uh, you know, real words from our real users' data were like, uh, like these compound words. And uh, for example, if we say, people are finding uh, words bestätigung, which means confirmation. Uh, they're not going to find emails which contain, for example, uh, you know, termin bestätigung means appointment confirmation, or uh, first hand bestätigung means uh, delivery confirmation, and so on. So um, with system that tokenizes just on white space, we, we said, OK, we have to change something. Otherwise, uh, it's really not that uh, user friendly in terms of you know, searching uh, um, email with uh, containing compound words or big long words. Um, so what we, and then another problem was actually that uh, the character equivalences in German or you know, these languages which, which have like uh, umlauts, which can be represented by a character and then the character E. And a uh, special SZ character, which can, be correct, which can be also represented by double S. So for example, if a user searches, on, uh, searches with use of character equivalences, he will not be able to find uh, email which is containing, you know, uh, which is actually written with a umlauts or SZ character. So these were the two problems that basically uh, started us to think that we cannot just have white space analyzer and we need some different strategy. 
So we decided, and, and by the way, we use Lucene directly, so we have to customize uh, everything on our own. So <clears throat> we decided to write our own custom analyzer, which will sit on top of the German analyzer that we have in Lucene. Uh, so the analyzer basically does is, uh, it starts with a compound word token filter in Lucene. Uh, there are two types of uh, compound word token filters. Uh, one is a dictionary compound word token filter, and another is a, a hyphenation compound word token filter. Uh, they basically both use dictionaries, but uh, the hyphenation one uses hyphenation grammar to to uh, identify where it can break basically a compound word into subwords. And then those subwords could be looked into the dictionary to find if that really matches. So that one is uh, the hyphenation uh, fil uh, filter is basically faster. So we chose to use that one to break our compounding words into the subwords. And then those subwords would then be passed to a German analyzer from Lucene so that we can process the umlauts or estet characters uh, into the character equivalences. Um, and then at the end, we store it into the index again. So that means uh, we, have the, we have the possibility of breaking down compounding words into subwords and then you know, pro processing umlauts and estet characters, etc. So let's take an example maybe. Uh, from our previous real data, uh, let's say we have a user who is, uh, who is having an email with term investigation, which means appointment confirmation, and we want to store it with our analyzer. So what it will do is first it will, uh, using hyphenation uh, grammar, it will break down this word into termine, best, and vestedigum. Best, best is basically coming out of vestedigum again uh, because it's recursive. So uh, that means we have now word for appointment, uh, best, and vestedigung, uh, which means confirmation. So we have the, we have the bro broken down subwords, and then we pass them to our German analyzer, which will then you know, process this umlaut and all, and make them as lowercase and term in best and vestedigung. So that's how basically the analyzer will break down the compounding words into the subword so that we can match, for example, the longest word we had seen before. We can also search it by uh, matching gazettes, for example. So uh, that's fine. So our user is saying, OK, thanks. I can find subwords now. But uh, can I really search my both emails in German and English uh, together now? Uh, so just an analyzer won't help it. Uh, we need some more um, uh, you know, techniques to identify how we are going to store our emails in different languages. So that's a criteria to, uh, to decide. And then we need something which will uh, understand what language our email basically is in. So first would be the language detection model, which will you know, de decide uh, which language uh, the document belongs to. So we, we, we develop one uh, simple logistic regression model based on a Wikipedia data set to identify the language. Uh, it detects languages with precision, but uh, the criteria here was not just precision, but also high recall for English, because although we are serving now multilingual, uh, the more or the most customers are still having English emails in our, uh, our corpus or our data. So we cannot uh, give the possibility that you know, English email being recognized as non-English. So uh, the idea for the language detection model was that a model which will give the highest recall for English so that it will identify the email uh, uh, from different languages as them, as, but it will mostly focus on not identifying English as non-English. So, so that part is, uh, is done there, but um, we still need to know how we are going to store our emails in, in Lucene Index. Uh, so there are uh, three, uh, so there are three generally as accepted ways to, to you know, put multilingual documents inside your Lucene Index. Uh, one is basically you create a separate index for every language and then you just, uh, store your documents in every language in that respective index. 
Uh, another is that you create a separate field for every language, so your index remains only one, but it has multiple fields. Uh, and then another would be uh, you just insert all the documents in one index and just have a field which tells you basically what language it belongs to. So let's look at them one by one. Uh, so the first one is a separate index. This is basically nothing but you create a, create a separate index whenever you want to you know, support a, a language. So new language comes in, you want to support that, um, then you just create an index and store, start storing your documents in that language into this separate index. Um, this provides a you know, clearer structure because every language has got their own index. It also do doesn't match up in your term frequencies considering every document is in its own data set. Um, and um, basically, it, it also gives you a better handling for a uh, ling particular language query, you know, the lang a query regarding a particular language. So uh, that's that. And then second one is the separate field for language. In this approach, you will now have to create, uh, for every language, a separate field. So for example, if your, content is, your field is content uh, and every email has a different language, then you have to have separate field like English content, German content. French content and so on. And now with this approach, the problem is that uh, if you start now saying, okay, I'm going to support Italian as well from tomorrow, then you have to change your index schema, uh, you have to change your fields because you have to add new field there. So you have to re-index all your documents uh, in that index. And it's, it's very hard for, uh, for you know, uh, systems where the data is really large. Um, but it could be, so it could be for, uh, easier for, I don't know, with, some systems where your data, your indexes are small and volatile maybe, you can just uh, re-index those. Um, it really depends on, on your use cases basically, but, um, but it, it brings overall, overhead of you know, extra fields into index while indexing as well as query. Um, and the third approach is uh, you create separate documents per language, so that means basically nothing but you create one index there will be a field which will tell you what language that document belongs to. Uh, and you, you just reuse your fields, basically. There is no separate field for any uh, separate language. Um, this, also, this approach also scales well with um, you know, uh, in increasing number of language support. For so example, you, you have a new language you want to support. You just store your document inside your index and just create, a, you specify which language it is in your language field. But since all languages are mixed up, uh, it, that, that could be a, a wrong term frequencies problem. And uh, um, it, yeah, I mean, it, it depends again your, uh, your project, but uh, what, we de what we decided is to better keep it clean so we have every language its own, its own index, basically. So, so we have now a language detection model, we have now a way to, dis way to you know, store all your emails in a separate language, separate index. But uh, our friend is saying that, okay, I can't find my German and English emails now because I, we are storing it separately. But uh, your system is returning email containing word Bestätigung as top result when I search for best. So he wants to have the ability to search uh, the subwords, but he says, okay, you cannot just search it, you just have to uh, improve it in terms of relevance and uh, uh, precision. So the what, what's the what problem here is that we have, you know, balance, uh, we have to balance our precision and recall. Basically we increase uh, recall by adding uh, new terms in our index uh, while we decompounded it. But we lost precision because now as, as our friend was saying that we can, uh, we can, match more emails or more documents to our queries because we have matching terms. So um, there, could be, there could be two ways to, to handle this. One is, to, uh, one is to do query log analysis. So what, what you can do is basically you analyze your query logs and see what users are searching or how they are searching and you can feedback that basically back to your analyzer saying uh, you know to fine tune your parameters where to cut your subwords or how how much uh, longer you want to go for your subwords or how small they should be because if the if you if you cut for like a small length of um, subwords it's going to create more terms and then it it's going to be 
the situation that you are matching more emails. So basically, you can say, okay, I'm going to, let's say, I'm going to create subwords only if they are length of five or four, and then you will not have that many, that many terms created out of your analyzer and basically not matching everything. So you minimize the uh, uh, number of terms that are getting stored uh, and number of uh, emails that are matching there. Uh, another way was uh, to rewrite your queries. So what, what we can do is we, we store um, the output of our analyzer, not basically into the same field, but into a separate field. So what you can do is you create another field called, I don't know, subwords and store your, cont store your subwords into that field. And whenever your user is searching, you boost your actual um, field over your subwords field so that uh, docs containing uh, you know, the actual word that will be ranked higher than they, than they were matched just due to being in the subwords. So what I'm saying is, for example, the Termin Bestätigung uh, created best Bestätigung and Termin. So you save those uh, subwords into your another field so that you only boost when when somebody is searching for best, you only, only boost the words best in the content field and not from the subwords field. So the guy was, you know, our user was complaining why I get emails with Bestätigung uh, as a top result when I'm searching for best. Uh, we can solve it by that way that we have only emails with best uh, at the top of our result. So in a nutshell, I would say uh, we build a we build a language detection. So basically, this scales for all languages. German and English were the most interesting one because of our use case as well as the, the ability to you know, compound, compound the words. But in, in a nutshell, uh, we can say that we, we need a language detection model which identifies which language uh, document belongs to. Then we need to decide on a structure, how we are going to store our emails or documents, whether in one index or separate indexes. Then in case of languages where there is a uh, compounding word, there are compounding words or something like that, we need an analyzer which analyzes correctly and you know, brings the subwords out of it. Um, and then in, in, in terms of improvement, we can always rewrite queries to boost the documents, uh, to boost the fields, correct fields, so that the, the um, relevancy matches better and there is no loss of precision. Um, so that's, that's all from my side, actually. Uh, also, and we are hiring smart engineers like all you guys. Uh, please join our, <laughs> visit our careers page. Uh, uh, and yeah. Wow. Question from Mike McCandless. That's a, <laughs> that's a great thing. <laughs> Multilingual search is incredibly hard and incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So you built a language detector, which is a missing piece of infrastructure in the open source world. So mm -hmm. two questions. Do you know about Google's compact language detector, which is an open source language detector factored out of the Chromium open source web browser? Mm -hmm. First question. Second question, do you have plans to open source your model? Um, sorry, I did not get the second question. What was it? Do you have plans to open source your language detector? Oh, OK. Because this uh, is a piece of infrastructure so many people need. It really ought to be a solved problem by now in the open source world, but it's not Yeah. yet. So uh, we built our own custom model because we are, uh, you know, we use it as a part of our email processing system, basically, to identify which, which documents they are belonging to. And um, we have a separate data analytics team which, which created that, uh, that language detection model. Um, we are actually also quite in, uh, involved in open source. Uh, we, are, we are starting to involve, as, as, as I can say. Um, but I don't really have any in output, uh, you know, any, any answer for that if we are going to open language detection model, but I can check, sure. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. I can ask that. Did you encounter a situation where a document could have multiple languages? Like, uh, yes, uh, of course. Uh, so, so how did you address that problem? So uh, in that case, uh, what we do is we rely on users' uh, query or the you know, corpus. So for example, if we can take an example of a word museum, 
which is same in German and English, basically. In that case, uh, there will be English documents containing museum as well as German documents containing museum. So uh, in that case, what we do is basically we search on all languages the user has because he has all languages. He has documents in all languages. So we have to serve them. But if his, his corpus is more of German, then we boost those, dec do those records basically so that he gets uh, uh, higher precise records of uh, German emails.